In qualitative research, there are no variables to test like you'll find in quantitative research. Since there's no variables, there's only information to find out about. There's nothing to compare to necessarily, although in some qualitative dissertations, people will do some sort of comparative analysis with different cases if they're doing a multiple case study. But in of itself, there are no variables and therefore there's nothing to test in regards to variables in a qualitative study. Central research questions first, then align the interview questions. What I mean here is that I suggest first you write the central research questions for all qualitative work and then align your interview questions. There's nothing wrong with having an idea of what you want to ask people about before you solidify your central research question, but keep in mind that the idea of interview questions is to give you data, some sort of findings once you analyze the interview data and make it so that you can answer a central research question. Central research question is normally the question that when answered will help fill the gap in the literature or give you more information on the disparity between theory and actual practice. In qualitative research questions, we seek to explore. We discover lived experiences to learn why or how something happened or is what is that happened. In the other lessons I have in this program, particularly about case study, phenomenology, I give examples of research questions and the alignment. If you haven't viewed those lessons yet, know that I have even more information on aligning research questions for those designs. And I also give more explanations about the concerns I have with many faculty who don't truly understand the differences of the case studies that are available and how each case study, as are all the designs required to provide information specifically for that purpose. In the qualitative research questions, you do need to tie in a framework. More times than not, there's a conceptual framework in qualitative research which doctoral students will need to include and have aligned somehow into their research questions. And more than likely, that would be found cascaded into one or more of the interview questions. So if you happen to be doing research in the area of transformational leadership, your research questions will need to have something in there about transformational leadership. And that's going to allow for that tie into the framework. If you're going to do something in healthcare management, then your research questions will have some sort of tie into healthcare management. As you start to learn more about developing research questions, you'll find it is not as easy as it sounds to put them together. In qualitative research, while many things are simple, they often are not as easy as they seem at first. Your qualitative questions will have to be related somehow to the specific problem in a dissertation. Most universities require a student to address a holistic problem, something that's happening throughout maybe an industry or a country, and then they go into a specific problem, which is where you will be doing your research, if it's your situation, and what is the problem they're experiencing. This would be something of a narrowing effect from the general problem of what's going on in the United States to something that's happened in a smaller region. For example, one area I talk about that helps people understand this difference is that in the United States, there's a general problem. It's a holistic problem in the United States that the small business failure rates of people who start a new business is about 50% in the first two years. That means if you happen to live in the United States and you're gonna start a business, you have about a 50-50 chance that you're still gonna be in business two years later. Now, specifically in Denver, Colorado, the city averages 56%. That exceeds the national average. Now, note how I brought the information from the general problem to the United States to Denver, Colorado. Denver, Colorado exceeds the national average. 
So as you would put research questions together, you would have to ground it in some way to the location and unit of analysis of the study in Denver, Colorado, because that's where the specific problem is. I have a complete lesson strategy if you want more help with this, particularly on the alignment of the problem statement to the research questions and the purpose study, and then of course to the interview questions, in a program I have online on my website, it's called a bundle, it's 58 individual lessons on how to write every heading in every section of chapters one, two, three, four, and five. There's 58 lessons, one for each of those sections. So if you wanna learn more information, I have that available already, and it's available for immediate access on my website. I believe, and this is some area of concern with others, but I am of the school of thought that you should have one item per question. If there's two things you want to learn from a population you interview, my recommendation is then one research question for each item. Don't ask people to describe and then give you some other information that you might want to know. If you do that, then certainly have one research question and ask how people describe it. And then the second research question about what it, more you want to know. The point being that if you have too many items that you want to learn about in one research question, it'll make the end process of analyzing it much difficult than you think. The idea of keeping the end in mind when I talked about that item specifically in the 10 things you need to know about qualitative research, that's one of the lessons in this program, is to better understand, if you will, from an academic or any kind of informed consumer of research, that if you have more than one item per question, it's going to make the data analysis more difficult later. Plus, ideally, you're going to have each interview question mapped to one research question. So if you have two items in one research question, it's going to be difficult to draw out the different interview questions for the data analysis later. It would be much easier if you wanted to learn two things from your research, that you had research question number one and number two, and then perhaps you have three or four interview questions to give you the information to be able to complete the research question number one, and then you map maybe two or three or four other interview questions to research question number two. Now you have what's called a clean analysis opportunity, a clean study, because it's easy to see the alignment and how interview questions are derivative of individual research questions. This may sound a little awkward if you haven't done any research yet, but if you haven't and you're getting ready to start, believe me, it won't take you long to truly understand the concepts that I'm relating to you right now. And if you're just going through this program because you want to learn more about research, my recommendation is look at a couple of research studies. One, perhaps where the researcher, the author, had only one qualitative research question, and another where they had two or more. And then look at the complexity of the data analysis and see if you can find the alignment. My general thought and recommendation and guidelines to students and even in my corporate work is if you're going to do qualitative research, particularly for a case study or phenomenology, only have one research question. One research question makes it easy and easier to complete your dissertation and graduate sooner than if you have too many questions. Keep in mind that an academic dissertation is just an assignment of the many you had in your program. No sense making it any more complicated than you need to. You can produce a significant, substantial outcome. Almost all of my mentees over 20 years who have done qualitative research have had one research question. Some universities will not allow you to have two or more. So there's a good reason for only having one also if you happen to be in one of those universities. In a corporate setting, it's not much different. We tend to do research for a specific reason, something that's very focused. If something's very focused, why do you need more than one research question? You're looking to fill the gap in the literature, or you're looking to help close the disparity between theory and practice. If you have too many research questions, 
that may indicate that you're not really focused for that one study. Oftentimes when I see a student with two or more research questions, I can almost make the case that that could be two or three different research studies in themselves because the questions are not really closely aligned with each other. They could be two different things that they're trying to find out about. For the journey person or somebody who's never done research before, this may not make a lot of sense. It may seem like, well, I can have two research questions. Quantitative research has usually three or more. Well, quantitative research is different. There, they're testing variables. And qualitative research, do not compare anything to quantitative research because that's like comparing apples and oranges. Yes, they're both fruit, but they're completely different types of fruit. Qualitative and quantitative are both research methods, but they're different. Interview questions need to be mapped to the research question. And this is also an area where I find there's a disparity among students and many faculty who teach programs or are mentoring and guiding students in their research, not understanding that for every interview question, there should be a reason why that interview question was conceived. It needs to align somehow with a framework or a specific problem or something that's in the literature review, something that's going to be aligned to that research question. If you have one central research question and 20 interview questions, chances are you're asking more questions than you need to. Keep in mind, this is a dissertation. You're not out there just to find out more to help make your career better and gain great insights about many different things. It's about how to produce your doctoral dissertation and graduate and learn about research while it's being guided. Every time I have a student who puts together their interview questions, I'll ask them, why are you asking each individual question? Show me how it's aligned, how it's mapped back to the research question, how it is in alignment to a framework or a specific problem or something that's indicating the gap in the literature, which should be, of course, inherent in the research question. As you start to look at interview questions, if you're asking more than six or eight interview questions for one research question, you're probably outside the scope of where you need to be. This concept of what I'm trying to share here in qualitative research question alignment is to help you better understand how to put a complete research study together easier, better to produce more significant, substantial results that people will actually use. If you ask too many interview questions and you have too many research questions, the output is more than likely going to be overly vague and not very specific to the problem that the research was designed to produce some information about. Now I'm going to share with you, as I indicated in the early part of this lesson, a few case study examples of research and interview questions so you can get a, a sense for the alignment. I could teach an entire semester on just alignment of research questions. So I, there's no way I can do it in this lesson strategy, but I can give you a few examples. And if you're willing to learn more, I'll give you other areas where you can locate places to go or to examine to help you as well. I have those recommendations at the end of this lesson. The case study types that I mentioned in the lesson titled case studies, I mentioned that there's different case studies. There's explanatory, exploratory, descriptive, intrinsic, instrumental, there's single case studies, there's multiple case studies. The idea is, is that, you know, when you have more than one case study, it's like a collective case study, if you will, because that's just the collective aspect of putting everything together. And we tend to ask how and why, as well as what questions for the research questions and more than likely align the same way to the interview questions. Again, I'm going to show you a couple examples, but the why, how, and what tend to be the beginnings of research questions. Here's an example of descriptive case study. And I just made this up so you can see how I would go about putting something together. This is not from an actual study. I will share a couple real examples with you in a few more slides. But if you're going to do a descriptive case study, you might have something like how do the participants describe. If you're doing a descriptive case study, you need to ask, describe. How do they describe 
the application of emotional intelligence during the election year in the Department of Commerce in the United States. Now, here are some potential interview questions you might have to that central research question I just read. How do you describe applying emotional intelligence in your daily work habits? How do you describe the reaction by your subordinates when you told them you would be applying emotional intelligence to creating their performance appraisals? Or another example is what characteristics of emotional intelligence describe your way of leading subordinates? Notice in the central research question is the word describe. Every interview question would be asking for them to describe something. This is alignment to a descriptive case study. So it's pretty simple to see the alignment here because I put italics for the word describe in every situation. The research questions at the top, three potential interview questions at the bottom. If you're going to include the purpose, it would be something like the purpose of this qualitative descriptive multiple case study is to describe the common understandings of the application of emotional intelligence during election year in the Department of Commerce in the United States. Then this research question would align as well would be the interview questions. Here's an explanatory case study example. Explanatory case study central research questions. I've got two here for you to consider in case you wanted to look at how it could be written different ways. How do quality managers socialize to their subordinates, the benefits of Lean Six Sigma applications, thinking, making process more effective in higher education institutions in Southwest Florida. And another example is how do human resource managers explain the onboarding process when they hired at small businesses in Denver, Colorado? Notice how in each of the two questions, you'll see the word explain because the idea here is for the alignment of an explanatory case study is you are going to need people to explain something to you. So here are two examples of explanatory case study interview questions. How do you explain the benefits of applying Lean Six Sigma during weekly meetings with subordinates? Another example would be how do you explain the onboarding process to candidates being considered for hiring? Again, the alignment is with the word explain, because in an explanatory case study, you're only going to ask people to explain something to you, explain something that actually happened. So as you start to see from these examples, and a few more I'll share, is that it's critical to truly understand what research design you're going to apply and then how to align the central research question to interview questions. In phenomenology, here's an example of a central research question. What are the lived experiences of successful Hispanic owners of small businesses in Fort Lauderdale, Florida? Now, phenomenology design is designed specifically to help us better understand lived experiences, which are defined, as I noted in that specific lesson on phenomenology, assumptions, beliefs, and perceptions. Those are the only things we ask about. So getting the alignment in the interview question, as you see in the examples, are what are your assumptions with or about the phenomena that they're going to be addressing in a study? What do you believe about the phenomena? What are your perceptions with or about that phenomena? I didn't put in everything that's found in that research question because I just wanted to make sure that you could see that in the interview questions, we're only going to ask about what people's assumptions, beliefs, and perceptions are. As I've addressed in a couple different lessons in this Understanding Qualitative Research program, is we do not ask about feelings. We would not ask, what are your feelings about the phenomena? Feelings are designed specifically for those who have a background in psychology. Or perhaps if you are a psychology student working on your psychology PhD, then that would be okay for you because you're being chaired and led by somebody who has that sort of background and probably already has their own PhD in psychology and therefore are skilled and qualified to assess and guide people about asking and then analyzing results of feelings. So if you're not in one of those programs, we just don't ask about feelings. 
and I address that in the 10 things you need to know about qualitative research as well as when I address the case study and phenomenology lesson. So as you have gone through this program or depending on where you listen to this lesson in the program collective lessons, you'll find overlap because I want to ensure there's alignment even in my program as you would need to have in your research. Now in a narrative research, narrative research focuses on studying a single person and gathering data through a collection of stories that are used to construct a narrative about the individual's experience and the meanings the person attributes to them. So here might be an example of a central research question. What are the experiences of a chief executive officer who rose through the corporate structure who started in the mailroom? So this might be a question that you might ask somebody like Jack Welsh who went from the mailroom to be the CEO. This is the type of alignment you would have in such a design. And a couple interview questions for alignment would be something like this. What was your strategy to higher levels of accountability? Or what do you attribute your success to? Now, because this is a narrative study, we're asking something very specific of the person being interviewed on what happened to them, what they believe happened to them. Here are a couple examples from several of my mentees who have gone on to graduate and their dissertations are available in ProQuest should you care to download them. Most of my mentees have their work approved on the first pass through the reviews because I help them understand everything you're getting in this program. Imagine if you're one of my mentees, you wouldn't have to have this program because I would be guiding you, but I can't help everybody. And therefore that's the reason why I put this program together and I also put together for faculty to help them learn even more about qualitative research as well as others in different research settings. Each of the examples I'm going to share with you provide me written consent to use their work in this program so that I could help others. They own the copyright of their own work. I only own the copyright of this specific program. So I do have consent to use their work. And the first one is Dr. Maria Appointe and her dissertation is titled Selling, the Lived Experiences of Domestic Property and Casualty Insurance Leaders. Now, depending on how many lessons you have gone through in my program and your own level of knowledge before you started, you might be able to gain from just reading the title that this study was a phenomenological study because we're looking for the lived experiences. And who are we looking for? Those experiences from domestic property and casualty insurance leaders. Just so happens that her work was also done in Puerto Rico. So here is her research question. What are the lived experiences of domestic property and casualty insurance leaders with respect to selling? Now, Dr. Mohammed Nozari is another mentee of mine who had his work approved on the first pass through the university an outstanding job. You might want to look at his dissertation if you want to gain insights about understanding self-managed teams using biomimicking, a descriptive case study. So now, even from his title, of course, it's written out there. It's a descriptive case study, and you can gain the sense from the title what his research was about. Now, here is his purpose statement, the purpose of this qualitative descriptive multiple case study was to describe common decision-making strategies for self-managed teams as experienced by team members using behaviors exhibited in intelligent swarms in IT company in Toronto, Ontario. That's in Canada. Now you can see the alignment to his research question, which is almost the same words as the purpose statement. And I talk about this particularly in the case study lesson as well as phenomenological lesson on how to do this alignment. But you'll see the words after what are the common decision making strategies are the same words. So you'll see the words above in the purpose statement. Now all we're looking for what are the common decision making strategies of those people that he interviewed. So this is how we look at alignment. Writing a research question can be this easy and look for the alignment as easy as it is if 
the work is designed well. So if you can design a good purpose statement, you should be able to take the words out after the purpose of this qualitative, descriptive, multiple study and use the exact same words seeking what are the common strategies. Where can you find examples to learn even more about? And I encourage you to, particularly if you're a faculty member, I encourage you to learn more about the alignment and how to guide others. And if you're a student, you can certainly look at ProQuest dissertations. You've probably already been guided to do that for gaining insights for how other people produce their dissertation, not only from a research design, but also scholarly writing, APA formatting, and just to get a sense that, you know what, if other people can do it, so can you. Look at different research studies that are out there. It doesn't have to necessarily be research studies that are academic. There's much out there in the corporate research world. There's many different types of magazines and journals out there and different type of research grant reports that are, you can find. There's all sorts of information that you can find great examples in. You can also look at many different research books. In this program, in specific lessons about research designs, I've offered a number of different books that might be able to help you learn even more that way. One of the best places I believe is Sage Research Methods Online. This is in your online library. If you have an affiliation with the university, if not, you can just Google it or any internet search for it and just type in Sage Research Methods Online. If you don't have a university affiliation, chances are you're gonna to have to pay for a subscription. The good thing is your tuition at a university is covering that for you. They already have access for you. All you need to go is go and get it, your program, so you get your mindset straight and you don't make mistakes that you might otherwise. And again, that's at my website, taken to be of ABD backslant our hyphen courses. And there's other help I have. If you have questions about this lesson or anything, please feel welcome to send me those. You can do it in Facebook group or Facebook page titled Taken to Be of ABD or Send it through my website at taken to be of abd.com or even in LinkedIn. I have a group in LinkedIn as well. And guess what that's called? Taken to be out of ABD. Everything's consistent. If you know what taken to be out of ABD means and you want to take that B out because you want to graduate and be all dissertation, well, I'm the expert to help you do that. And that's why I do what I do. If you like this lesson, please refer it to others. Leave a note if you see it on Facebook or anywhere else and you want to say what the value of this lesson strategy was, I would certainly appreciate that. And any referrals you do, I would appreciate that as well because then I can help more people. My ending thought here in this lesson is if you cannot align your research questions now, when is a good time to learn? Well, hopefully you just learned that in this program and through this lesson and Repetition will help you listen to this lesson over and over as many times as you need to. You have access to it for more times to listen to than just once. You can listen to it all year round if you need to, but it's here for help as well as I am. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. I enjoyed narrating it for you.